You know, if there was any television or movie series that was made for the male species, I think it was Mission Impossible. Can I get a witness? Now, some of you in this room are old enough to remember the Mission Impossible television series. You don't want to identify yourself if you were ever an avid fan of that. Uh, you're showing your age. I don't remember that at all, but I've always been a big fan of the Mission Impossible movie series with Tom Cruise. Has anybody seen this trilogy? It's always full of great action, great actors, you know where action sequences, the plot always unravels, full of twists and turns that you never see coming at all. And yet as diverse as each Mission Impossible episode or movie is, they have one common element, one common action that happens at the beginning of every episode. And that is that the agent from the IMF, the Impossible Missions Force, receives his mission from intelligence in the government. And that mission is always received by way of a videotape. If you notice this, either a DVD or a PDA device in the second movie, I think it was even a pair of sunglasses in which Tom Cruise could see and hear the message through the sunglasses. Tom Cruise receives the message, the mission, and then a voice comes on that says, this message will self-destruct in five seconds, and it's gone. Mission Impossible is on. What if I told you that this ball game called The Church was meant to be as exciting, as exhilarating, as high stakes, and as high risk as a Mission Impossible series? What if I told you that the mission that Jesus passed off to His disciples at the beginning looked like Mission Impossible? It looked like something completely outrageous, something that they could never accomplish on their own. You know, it takes some work for those of us as 21st century Christians down in Macon to imagine church that way. Church not as a worship club for the already initiated, the already convinced, but church as a mission to those who are apathetic, agnostic, even hostile to the role of God in their lives. Well, in actuality, that's the mission impossible that Jesus gave to the church. The book of Acts in the New Testament is the script of this mission. Even if you've never read the New Testament before, you can get a bird's eye view in a hurry of what Acts is all about. Acts is simply a concise history of the quick expansion of the early church in the first century throughout the Roman world. And check this out. All of the elements of a great Mission Impossible theme, sequence, episode, movie are in the book of Acts. They're built right in. There's intrigue. There's murder. There's violence. There's quick thinking. There's corporate drama. In fact, if someone were writing the book of Acts for our day, they probably wouldn't call it Acts. They'd probably call it something like the mission of the church, Mission Impossible. And so I invite you to turn just to the opening few verses of the book of Acts, and we'll have those on the screens as well, where we're going to dig in to the church, Mission Impossible. Look at the first verses. It says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day He was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles He had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So the author of this book is Luke. And Luke is alerting us to the fact that he has written a formal, former book which came to be called the Gospel of Luke. He writes to this Roman official, this friend of his, Theophilus, and Luke draws a line in the sand between what he's written in the past and what we're about to get in the book of Acts. See, Luke's former book is all about the mission of Jesus. And Luke hits the high points here in the first few verses. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead to vindicate all that he was and all that he said. The fact that Jesus taught about the kingdom of God, what life looks like when God is allowed to lead that life. But now Luke lets us know that he's not going to talk about the mission of Jesus anymore. He wants to talk now about the mission that Jesus has assigned to his followers. And what we're going to see is that it's an impossible mission. Look at verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus lets his followers know that this impossible mission that he is about to give them is going to be so dangerous. It's going to be so difficult that they're not going to be able to make one inch of progress without the sense of the power of God undergirding them and pushing them forward. What happens in the next verse is actually kind of funny. Not only does it mean that these guys have been following Jesus around for three years now, 
and yet they are quite clueless as to what the next step of the mission is. But it also shows us that the disciples don't really want an impossible mission. They want a mission that's conventional. They want a mission that's logical. And even more importantly, they want a mission that targets people like them. Look at verse 6. So when they met together, they asked Him. They means Jesus' disciples. The guys who have been closest to Him. They asked Jesus, Lord, are You at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That means, Jesus, when are You, or when are you going to make us an independent state again? This is a time in which the Roman Empire has come and taken over Israel. They enforced their brutal policies upon Israel. And people in Israel are waiting for a Messiah to come and kick those Roman butts straight out of Israel. Can I say butt in church? Is that okay? <laughs> so the disciples are like, when, when, when does that start? Like, when does this program really get going? Because Jesus, you know, our message is really targeted toward people like us. We ought to really focus on Israel, Jesus, because we have so much, we share so much common ground with our fellow Jews. We believe in the same God. We believe in the same history. We believe in the same cultural, religious, and faith traditions. Jesus, however, shocks the disciples by saying, guys, you're confusing the starting line for the finish line. Look what he says in verse 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by His own authority. Jesus says, look, I'm not primarily about a political revolution here. I'm about something that's a whole lot more expansive than the time or dates that God has for the authority over one simple nation. We're going global with this thing. Look at verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus says, guys, forget about Israel because that's going to be in the rear view mirror in no time. In no time. Judea is important. Jerusalem is important. Eventually, we'll get to Samaria. But guys, that's only the starting line. We're not building this movement to reach people like us, fellow Jews with whom we share all of this common ground. We're going global. We are taking this movement to the ends of the earth. I know the ends of the earth kind of sounds like a metaphor in our language today, doesn't it? It sounds like Jesus is just saying, in general, we're going to spread out across the planet and we're going to take our message and our movement and our mission everywhere. But in actuality, in the world of Jesus, that term ends of the earth meant something very specific. In fact, it meant something that would make the blood in every Jewish heart grow cold when they heard about it. Because when Jesus looked at those 12 men and said, we're going to the ends of the earth, they knew exactly what He was talking about. He was talking about the epicenter of evil, brutality, bloodiness, oppression, and death in the ancient world. Jesus looked at those 12 guys and said, essentially, forget about Israel. Forget about people like you. You're going to Rome. That's your mission. Impossible. It takes a little bit of work in our day to understand just how outrageous this was. The whole notion of going to the city of Rome. Nowadays, Rome is somewhere you visit if you can accumulate a lot of money and go on a really nice vacation, right? You get to go to the Vatican, you see the Colosseum, you see the sights, you eat good Italian food. Trust me, Rome did not have that connotation to these first century Jews. In fact, Rome was the hub of the greatest, most expansive, most brutal empire to ever rule in human history. Rome was at its peak as Jesus gives this mission to His disciples, ruling over 4,000 cities, over 44 nations. At the tip of the sword, the Roman armies were known for the most ridiculous brutality in all of warfare, ancient or modern. They were known for committing the atrocity of genocide among entire population groups. They would attack major cities and enslave the entire population. This was absolutely routine. Not only this, but Rome was a place of paganism. It was a place of child sacrifice and human sacrifice. It was a place in which starvation and plague would commonly sweep through the city of one million people and wipe out more than half of the population which lived in utter poverty, which lived as, lived as slaves to the elite Romans. Rome was a place in which the power of the blasphemous Caesar was on full display as statues, monuments, and buildings proclaimed that Caesar was the Son of God on every major corner of the empire. Tacitus was a first century Roman senator and historian. And he wrote this about the city he loved. 
he wrote that all things shameless and bizarre flocked from the whole world to Rome. It was a fearful place for first century Jews. Well, not only this, but there's another little minor detail about the city of Rome that was very applicable to the, these 12 Jewish guys that Jesus is talking to, and that is the Romans kind of had a blanket policy that they hated Jews. Yeah, this is an important caveat to remember. They hated them. They were racist toward them. They were prejudiced toward the Jews. They despised their customs and their traditions. Throughout the long history that Rome would share toward the Jews, they would literally kill millions of Jews. They would enforce slavery into the lives of hundreds of thousands of Jews. They would crucify tens of thousands of Jews, sometimes four or five thousand at a time. And, 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 and from time to time, the Caesars was, would actually issue edicts that the Jews could no longer be Jewish. They would take away their right to practice their identity, to practice their religion, to practice their cultural traditions. They would outlaw the Torah, the Old Testament. They would outlaw circumcision. They would outlaw the celebration of the Passover. The same historian and center that we just mentioned, Tacitus, wrote that the Jews are among the most disgusting and vile of all the races on planet Earth. And Jesus looks at these 12 unschooled, ordinary, semi-literate guys and says, all right, gentlemen, forget about Israel because that's where we're going. The place where people hate you, the place where people are hostile toward you, the place where no one will agree with you, you share no commonality with those Romans. That's where I'm sending you. And then look what happens in the next verse, as if all that weren't intimidating enough. After he said this, verse 9, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hit him from their side. The ancient equivalent of a message that self-destructs in five seconds. <laughs> Jesus looks at these guys and gives them this impossible mission. We are going to the heart of Rome, he says, with our message and our mission. And then he's gone like that with no further instruction. Think for just a moment what it must have felt like to walk in their shoes. Because they were just like us. And this ain't just a story, by the way. This stuff really happened. Think about it. Standing on that dusty Judean road where Jesus just gave you this thing that you know is beyond your capacity, your capability. You know it's outrageous. It makes no sense. And Jesus gives you the mission and ditches you cold. Imagine that feeling. Well, my friends, those of us who call Cross Connection home should feel that feeling today because we share the same mission. In the chair back in front of you, there's a sealed envelope. If you're in the front row, you'll have to turn around and get it. Everybody grab one of those envelopes right now. Let's take about 15 seconds of silence. Go ahead and open up that envelope because the Mission Impossible Cross Connection Church is right inside. There will be no exploding envelopes in the house today, although that would be cool. <laughs> If we could pull that off, we would have. <laughs> we have been sent on a mission to Rome, brothers and sisters. We have been sent on a mission to those who are doubtful, atheistic, agnostic, even potentially hostile to the role of God in their lives. If you're thinking that sounds impossible, I think you're starting to get the point. Because we as a church are hearing the same call that Jesus' disciples heard that day. To go to the hearts of those with whom we share very little in common and to implant the movement of Jesus in their lives.